John Sonnen is here from simpleprogrammer.com and today I've got uh, I've got Rian here and and Rian is a, a friend of mine and he happens to also work at the the Flow Research Collective and I thought it'd be kind of kind of cool to to talk to him a little bit about uh, flow, the flow state, which is something that, you know, as programmers, it's really, really important to to understand. There's a lot of new research in this area and showing the effectiveness of this and how you can get into this flow state. So uh, so welcome, Ryan. Thanks for having me, John. Appreciate it. And hey, guys, as well, to anyone who's watching. Uh, so yeah, love to tell you a little bit, John, about the Flow Research Collective, you know, what we do, what we mean by flow a little bit of the research around it, to, so that's cool. I could really tell when I was in the flow state or not in flow state, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't have the word for it, but it would be like, you know, I'd sometimes be working on a, a programming project and it seems like the entire day would just go by in an instant. And uh, and I just, you know, I would get so much done, but then some days I couldn't, it, it, it just didn't happen, but it's, just, it's those rare occasions when that happened that I was, you know, I felt like I was so productive and, and time just, just flew by. I didn't even feel like I was working. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, even when people aren't, you know, aware of what it is from a scientific standpoint or that there is a name for that state, everyone still intuitively, you know, kind of wants to get themselves there. And a lot of people, again, intuitively kind of orient their work days towards getting themselves into that state for as long as possible because it's when you're most productive. So yeah, what we do at the Flow Research Collective is firstly we study flow. So we've got a research institute, we're partnered with UCLA, USC, uh, Imperial College London, number of other universities, Formula One and some other institutions doing research into flow. So looking at what that state of you know extreme focus is from a neurobiological standpoint. So, you know, what's actually going on in the brain and in the body when people are in that state. And then we've got a sort of a training and consulting side as well. And we work with entrepreneurs, executives, athletes, creatives to a certain degree as well, teaching them how to access that state more consistently uh, and how to kind of take it from this, you know, sort of elusive thing that sometimes kind of happens maybe um, into a skill set so that you can, you know, get into that zone on demand or as close to on demand as possible and, you know, reliably recreate it and start spending more and more of your work day there. So the founder of your organization is, is Stephen, right? Stephen Kotler. Yeah. 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 Cause, cause I read, uh, the, was it the Superman? Um, I can oh, try and think of the, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, the rise of Superman, and I remember kind of at the end of the book, it was like, okay, well, you know, here's all the things that happen in flow, flow state, and uh, and it, and and you know, at, I think maybe at that po at point, the research wasn't quite there because the the answer was like, well, you know, if if your life depends on it, like the best way you can get into flow state is to be in a dangerous situation where you're going to die, like that will that will guarantee that you're going to get there. Um, but, you know, right now we don't know the, the answers, but but it sounds like a lot has happened since the time of that book, right? Because now you're telling me, OK, we can actually scientifically study this. We can actually purposefully put you in flow state or teach you how to do that. Right. Whereas, you know, that's that's the one thing. Like when I read the book, I was like, oh, shoot, I want I just want to know how to do it. Like now I'm 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 hooked. I'm like, all right, flow state sounds great. But how do I actually do it without, you know, jumping off of a of a cliff with the. <laughs> <laughs> with a parachute or you know <laughs> yeah it's funny so the way Stephen often describes this is that you know sort of we're evolutionarily hardwired for high performance and for flow and that's why a lot of those um a lot of those sports drive flow so aggressively because you're taking enormous risk you're in environments with high levels of complexity which require heightened information processing and things like that so from kind of an evolutionary almost safety standpoint <clears throat> those triggers which are extreme are, are sort of kicking you into that state so that you can deal with those complex and again from an evolutionary evolutionary standpoint dangerous circumstances so you get you get pushed into that state to be able to cope um, but yeah, through sort of looking at the research, looking at what flow actually is in the brain and in the body, um, we've been able to identify lots of different triggers that you can use without having to jump out of an airplane or whatever that you can use at your desk day to day to be able to almost sort of trick your physiology um, and get yourself into that zone consistently. Um, okay. Now, now for I know a lot of people have different 
ideas of what flow is what what exactly is flow? i mean probably some people are watching like i don't even know what you guys are talking about right now what is yeah <laughs> what is this, this flow? bring everyone up to speed because it's mm -hmm. funny i mean the word we sort of have an internal running joke about the fact that we all have a little bit of a problem with the word itself it just it sounds a little bit makey uppy it yeah. sounds a bit like energy or alignment yeah. or a manifestation or you know something like that um, but it's actually a technical term. It's a term that's used within positive psychology, and it was coined by a Hungarian psychologist called Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who wrote a book called Flow. Um, and it's a technical term. It's it's used yeah it's used within positive psychology, within psychology generally, and even within uh, you know the the sort of neuroscientific research that looks at this state as well. And so it's not something that we have labeled ourselves and it has a definition that exists outside of us as well and it's right. technically defined as an optimal state of consciousness where you feel your best and you perform your best and more specifically it refers to those moments where you know every action every decision arises seamlessly from the last you are so focused on the task at hand that all else sort of you know falls away and action awareness merge, your sense of self vanishes. So that kind of, you know, inner critic, that dialogue that people often have going on in their back of their mind uh, with themselves goes offline um, and your sense of time distorts. So you get time dilation where time either speeds up, which is usually what happens within knowledge work. And, you know, for programmers who are watching this, that's probably the experience they've had where, yeah, hours will go by and what feels like minutes, but then sometimes with more sort of physically induced or embodied flow states, time can slow down as well. You get that sort of freeze frame effect, like the way you hear people describe even things like car crashes sometimes. Um, and th as the research shows, when you're in this state, every aspect of performance, both mental and physical, go through the roof. So mm -hmm. give a little breakdown on some of the research and, and what that looks like, if that's helpful. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like so. So like it's like taking the limitless pill. The, <laughs> the, it's like, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny that. But yeah, I mean, it. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a breakdown of the research, and then I'll describe why, unfortunately, it's okay. not great as the limitless pill, um, and why yeah. we sort of close that gap and solve that problem. Because yeah, so the research done by McKinsey, which Stephen often uh, references found that executives when in flow are 500% more productive, which is an insane, wow. you know, it means that you can go to work on Monday, spend Monday in a flow state and get the same amount of work done as your steady state peers do in an entire week or go to work on Monday and Tuesday, spend both of those days in a flow state and be, you know, doubly as effective as the competition. And research done by Teresa Mible, a psychologist at Harvard, found that creativity spikes for up to three days after a flow state Research done by um, Advanced Brain Modeling and DARPA found that um, skill acquisition speed, which is kind of you know a fancy way of, of labeling learning, increases by 490 percent. And that was done by a study with snipers. Um, and research done at the University of Sydney again found you know 430 percent increases in creative problem solving. So, and that's just a small snippet of what the what the research looks like. Now the problem is, and the reason it's not you know, as good as the limitless pill and the reason that, you know, you probably don't hear people talking about it as much as you may think when you hear about this research is that it is an elusive state, you know, so mm -hmm. what usually happens is people will get into this state maybe half an hour a week or for a couple of hours every couple of weeks or whatever the case may be. And so if you're 500% more productive for half an hour a week, it's not going to actually be that revolutionary. It's not going to cause you to be limitless or be able to kind of, you know, accelerate as fast as he managed to do so in the movie. And yeah. so what we try and do through our training and our research is take it from this elusive, sporadic, you know, uh, infrequently recurring thing and make it a skill set. And as I mentioned, uh, teach you how to recreate it with reliability and consistency so that you can work towards spending you know, three hours every day in that state and then over time work towards spending the majority of your work day in that state. And it's then that you do start to see, you know, real insane impact in your life. Um, and it's then that it becomes, um, you know, really yeah, impactful and, and kind of uh, actually has a, a, a kind of a significant effect on, you know, the real life outcomes that people care about. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now that makes sense that 
yeah, you've got to put in you got to put in the work to get the the result. But yeah, I can imagine though, as a as a programmer, being able to lock into this flow state, even like three hours a day, would be phenomenal. Because if you can perform at you know several hundred percent uh, of the of your base level, that's that's an insane amount of productivity. And plus, the mm. idea also just that it's uh, you know I I think perhaps maybe one of the things that really drew me into doing programming was the was that you do get into that flow state. It, it's almost like when I was reading the Rise of Superman, and he was talking about. Uh, Stephen was talking about the like the extreme sports and how it's like you get a glimpse of this thing. And so that's what draws people to keep on doing it is like pushing it to the edge. It's it's almost the same thing. I think when you're programming, like you have those moments, it's a short period of time, maybe where you're in that flow state and you're keep on you keep on searching for it again. Like you want to keep on going so that you can experience that again, you know, and then it, but it's elusive, like you said, like you, you can't reliably. So so you keep on it, it almost creates that addictive quality to it. Maybe video games are so addictive because of the same reason as well. But 100 percent. 100% accurate. And so what they call that, they don't use the term addictive in the research, but they use the term autotelic, which essentially means that it is, you know, worthwhile in and of itself, just because it's such a pleasurable state to be in. And, and, and that's one of the reasons it's so advantageous, because it's simultaneously incredibly satisfying and pleasurable, and even correlated with outcomes around um, sense of overall life satisfaction and meaning, but it's also inherently, so long as you're deploying it on the right activities, a, a state that's inherently productive as well. Um, and obviously, you know, that productivity is going to be less impactful if, you know, it's being used within a video game, but it is an inherently productive state. And one of the things I always love to describe is that, you know, one of the reasons that surfers or action and adventure sports athletes will, you know, wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning effortlessly and, you know, pack their car and go drive five hours to some perfect beach break without even thinking about it uh, is because they're chasing that state and they want to get to yeah. that state. But one of the cool things that you can do is you can recreate that same state from a neurophysiological standpoint within any different activity. Mm -hmm. uh, certain activities are going to be more um, you know, effective for creating flow than other ones, but there is no reason from a neurophysiological standpoint that you can't be in somewhat of, of an exact same state when you're surfing as when you're programming. And so, you know, one of the things I love to describe, uh, or one of the ways I like to describe what we do is try and make work feel like skiing, you know, because even though the activity is vastly different, the state that you are in can be, you know, exactly uniform. Uh, which is cool. And then you can create, as you're saying, you can create that almost addictive feeling around your work, which is obviously super helpful um, because it shifts the whole paradigm from work being this thing that you've got to push yourself into uh, and you know, mm. yourself and whip yourself towards to this thing you're getting pulled into because of how badly you want to get back into that zone. Uh, yeah. No, that makes sense. I, I think that explains a lot of the really like super successful entrepreneurs that that everyone is like, how the heck can they do this? And I was watching a video from Sam Ovens the other day and he was talking about yeah, like, you, you, need to, you need to love your work, right? Yeah. And yeah. I was like, I was thinking, yeah, that doesn't like, I, I know what he, he believes what he's saying when I'm seeing that. And I, you know, a lot of the stuff that, that he says, I agree with 100%, but it's like, you can't just pick something that you love. It's not, that's not exactly, it's it's more like you have to like learn to love it. Like, yes. and and I think what's the reason why he's got that disconnect is because he is in, he must be accessing the flow state very often when he's working and so to him it seems like that's the answer and then you look at people like elon musk or jeff bezos like how does elon musk like do the i mean the guy works like insane amount and he's sleeping on the factory floors and you know you know as you're describing kind of the the, the surfer i'm thinking the same thing it must be that that elon must be accessing this flow state in order to be able to do this so it's where it's like you know, you. I think because you could look at these people and you're like, oh, they're superhuman. There's no way. Like, I can't even. I can't even. You know, it's hard for me to just focus and work for like six hours during the day. How could he just keep on doing this day after day, year after year? And it's it's because it's. He, I, I would assume that he's he's accessing flow state. That he's got something that's drawing him. That's making it where it doesn't feel like work. It feels like skiing, like you said. Exactly. Exactly. And, and it's when you look at guys like that. Um, that the you know 500% increase in productivity number seems totally reasonable as well. When you look at their output versus the output of the average person, it's it's not just 500% greater. It's you know 
many, many, many multiples greater than yeah. your average person. Like Elon Musk has accomplished, you know, arguably hundreds of lifetimes worth yeah. of output in you know, thus far. And he's, I don't know what age, he's late 40s or whatever already. So, and obviously that's down to, you know, not just him being in flow, but what he's doing in flow as well. It's not just a result of being in flow. Um, but yeah, but yeah, you're 100% right. And, and again, the point you made about the fact that you have to work to love your work is so critical. That's such a key mistake I think that people make is they mm. think that there's this kind of arbitrary thing out there in the world yeah. that I like, find that they love inherently rather than viewing it as a function of doing it, you know, developing skill, developing um, a level of mastery around it, learning how to get into flow during it and then having this kind of feedback loop be created um, where you know you get better at it, then you start to like it more, then you start to be able to get into flow with it, and this kind of thing tumbles, and then you grow to love it, and then you grow yeah. to, be able to get into flow more consistently with it, which you know just kind of turbo boosts the whole thing and creates this like aggressive sort of ability to progress effortlessly. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense because I've always wondered, you know, I've always asked like the question of, of you know, why is it that like when I'm, if I'm going to work, if I'm doing something that I don't want to do work, that's work, right? But if I'm playing a video game, that's fun. To my brain, right? To me, it feels different, but to my brain, it's the exact same signals. Mm -hmm. It's doing the same, like it's working in either case, right? It's In fact, it's probably working harder when it's playing a video game than it is, you know, exactly. like it's it, it's yeah. having to process information and do that. So to the body, it's exactly the same, but it, it's it, there's something else there and, and it you know i was thinking also about people like doing sudoku puzzles right it's like you know like choosing something like that's it, it's not really fun right i mean right. people find it fun right but all you're doing is like you're just doing math puzzle you know what i mean like but yeah. but it's i think it's because you get so sucked into it right maybe you're you're kind of getting into that that flow state like everything else is kind of fading away and so that's why you know that's like i mean when you think about like again like to from from just a you know just looking at it doing something like sudoku puzzles or crossword puzzles or logic puzzles or any kind of those things that should be work it should not be fun mm -hmm. but people enjoy it right whereas if they have to go to work and crunch numbers on an excel spreadsheet they don't like it but it, but essentially they're the same thing it's it's one of them though they they must be you know at least in some way accessing that flow state i, I would i would assume that's a difference i don't know what do you think about that I think for sure, yeah, exactly. I think again, it's it's like just this key distinction between sort of activity and state, and mm -hmm. what people want is the state. You know, they right. want to want to feel a certain way. They don't necessarily care whether or not they feel that way uh, because of it being through a certain activity. It's just that certain activities have this almost like contextual wrapping around them, where they're sort of labeled or plastered as as fun or like this is leisure. This yeah. is fun. And then also by default, a lot of those things, games, obviously video games, sport, are, are activities that are rich inflow triggers. So they are going to make people get into that state. Um, whereas, you know, work, firstly, doesn't have that kind of almost like cognitive framing around it. So people are already sort of coming in the gate without the presumption that they'll be able to get into a state of flow uh, in work. And then also, I mean, the other challenge is that oftentimes for a lot of people, their work just does not have uh, many flow triggers in it. And by the way, just to, to bring people up to speed, so flow triggers are essentially preconditions that need to be in place for you to be able to get into flow. And there's 21 mm -hmm. triggers that have been identified in the, in the research. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, so when I say flow triggers, there, there are certain things that need to be in place within a given activity for it to kind of trigger a spark flow. And for a lot of people, their work does not do that. But then for certain people, I think myself and you, in many ways, someone like Sam Owen, someone like Elon Musk, et cetera, et cetera, their work is also very rich in flow triggers, so they're able to get into it. But then when you learn what those triggers are, you can you know, proactively, consciously, explicitly put those into your work as well. There are ways to actually sort of, you know, manipulate your work and restructure your work to kind of artificially uh, embed flow triggers in it, which is then again, going to allow you to spark flow within your work. And again, get the same feeling within work as you do within Sudoku or video games or surfing or skiing or whatever the case may be. 
Okay. Okay. So so we can actually definitely like really do this and and make it so. So as a programmer, I could learn to to structure these flow triggers so I could actually get into this flow state like reliably, uh, without having to take take myself to the edge of of death. <laughs> yeah, or, or without right. having to take a pill. I do either. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what we do. Is we you know so again, flows is elusive thing. That the way you get into it is also this kind of you know mysterious unknown thing which most people aren't aware of, and by you know essentially kind of unveiling the curtain from that and deconstructing it all and saying no actually you know firstly this is what the state is from a you know neuroelectrical standpoint a neurochemical standpoint a neurobiological standpoint and these are the 21 different ways that this state gets triggered you can then again you know deconstruct the whole thing and start taking steps to proactively build a, a life uh, and you know a set of work processes that are going to you know orient you towards getting into that state of consistency. Okay. Now I know we don't have time to discuss all 21 of the of the triggers here and you know obviously if 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 people want to to find out more we'll have like a link in the description here where they can find out some some uh, some more stuff about flow what are some of the just a, you know a few of the flow triggers give us a taste. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So there's firstly there's a number of different categories of triggers at a high mm -hmm. level. So you've got environmental triggers. These were developed by a guy called Keith Sawyer in his book, Group Genius. Um, and excuse me, you've got group triggers, which were developed by Keith Sawyer. And they are actually triggers that take place within a group of people or, or multiple people. Um, yeah. and they can be extremely helpful to deploy within organizations, um, within meetings, and brainstorming sessions and things like that. You've got environmental triggers. Um, which are a lot of what Stephen talks about within Ride the Superman, and they're you know obviously very relevant to things like action and adventure sports. You've got psychological triggers, um, which are extremely helpful to be able to deploy within your workday as well. As are the environmental ones; they're cru crucial as well. There are creative triggers. So there's a number of different categories of triggers. To give three quick, specific examples um, of three that are pretty well known, and, and I would imagine. People watching have come across one of these, but the three are the challenge skills balance, clear goals, and immediate feedback. Um, and just to break down challenge skills balance, I imagine there's some level of familiarity around it. It's, it's been popularized by a number of different people, but essentially, this is the idea that you know flow kind of sits at the sweet spot between boredom and anxiety. So yeah. if the challenge level is too high for your skill set you're going to get kicked up into anxiety. And if the challenge level is too low for your skill set, you're going to fall down into boredom. It's just going to be mundane and it's going to be, you know, a slog. And so what you want to do is you want to have the challenge level of the activity or the work that you're doing just about above your current skill level. So You've got that kind of optimal level of challenge and you're sort of being perfectly stimulated. Um, and you're kind of almost like riding that line between boredom and anxiety, perfect stimulation and engagement. Um, and when you can do that, you can access flow more consistently. We, we provide, again, like very actionable, practical ways of being able to, we call it tune or manipulate the challenge skills balance so that you can, uh, so that you can, you know, ideally kind of have it be perfect and, and spend as much time in flow as possible through doing that. Um, and then, yeah, and then friction, I'm happy to mention a couple of things about friction. So these are not sort of, um, you know, strictly things that you will hear about within the research. This is more kind of anecdotally gathered information. But yeah, I mean, obvious, um, obvious blockers for flow are things like, you know, overwhelm, distraction, friction is a big one. Mm -hmm. and so in this video that we're going to offer people as well, like go into friction in detail um, and I think programmers in general and anyone who's sort of interested in optimization and productivity is, whether they know it or not, always trying to eliminate and, and minimize friction. Yeah. Um, and so in that video, which people can watch, I believe in the description, uh, I walk through four different ways that you can kind of extract friction out of your life, minimize friction, um, with the goal being obviously to you know, orient yourself towards flow as effectively as possible. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'm 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 interested in, in checking out that video as well. So I will be uh, I'll, I'll be checking that out. But guys, if you if you want to see how to eliminate the friction, definitely. Uh, I think we should have the link in the description. It'll probably be in the cards as well up here. But 
So I got another another question for you, and then we should probably wrap this up here. So how does this relate? I've got my muse, my meditation uh, you know, thing here. How does this relate to meditation? It seems like there's a connection here between flow and meditation, but uh, but I'm I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. So there's a number of answers. Um, firstly, you know, we always say that as a general rule, and this is really helpful to remember and important to remember as well, is that flow follows focus. So focus mm-hmm. and flow are not actually the same thing, but focus. Right is a necessary precondition to flow and you can almost think of it as like a meta trigger <clears throat> you need focus as the first thing before any of the other triggers are even almost going to be able to do their thing and meditation uh, and mindfulness trains broadly the ability to focus you know because that's what ah. you, you're literally you're focusing on something whether it be your breath whether it be you know kind of your interception and, and what's going on in your body, whether it be music with certain kinds of meditation. So it's going to contribute just generally to your ability to focus. It's going to also give you an ability to kind of you know regulate your nervous system a little bit and then sort of bring down stress, which again, in terms of the challenge skills balance is helpful in that it kind of brings down anxiety in a certain respect. Um, but then in terms of the distinction between meditation and flow, you know, meditation is a more passive state. So in meditation, you are you are not necessarily engaged in an activity beyond being aware of some kind of stimulus, whether again, whether it's breath or music or, or whatever it is, depending on the kind of meditation you're doing. Whereas flow is inherently an active and engaged state. Like you get into flow by doing something. Again, video gaming, working, um, Whatever the case may be, it can technically be any activity, but it, but it is an active state by default. So that can be another helpful kind of distinction to bear in mind as a, a key difference between flow and meditation. But there, again, there's a lot of similarities, especially in terms of things like the selflessness and, and you know the potential within meditation for timelessness and things like that. There is overlap between those states as well. Okay, yeah, that that makes sense. I, I like I like that. So so I could use meditation as something that would help me develop the focus, which would make it it's a prerequisite for flow anyway. So developing yeah. that focus is good. Okay. All right. That makes sense. All right. Well, this is awesome. Yeah. Thanks for, for spending the time and, and, and teaching us about flow. I'm, I'm super interested in it now. I really want to, <laughs> I want to figure out if I, how to do this. I, I feel like, like learning how to do this, especially for, I mean, I'm not, I'm not programming as much anymore myself, but man, as a programmer, being able to tap into this, I feel like it would have been extremely valuable. But even just, you know, with the work I'm doing now, you know, I I, I certainly am able to tap into it from time to time, I, I, I know, but I, I don't have a way of making sure that I can. So uh, definitely interested to find out more about this. And guys, if you want to hear more about Flow, definitely, you know, click the link in the description. We'll also have it in the card uh, about uh, how to eliminate friction. And uh, yeah, all right. Well, well, thanks a lot, man. Super. Thanks, boss. No, this was fun. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, thanks to everyone for watching. And yeah, as John mentioned, if you want to uh, want to learn more, check out the video. You can go from there. All right. Awesome. All right, brother. All the best.